live, I hope. Um, if people can hear me, that's great. Um, I can't actually see myself, so full screen, so I'm hoping it's, it's, it's all go. Um, I'll be reading from this book. It's my newest novel. It's called The Second Star. Oh, hang on just a moment, Alma. I'm sorry. Hang on just a moment. I'm sorry about that. Hang on. Hello? How do I hide myself? <laughs> okay, I got it. All right, is that better? Okay. All right, I'm going to assume I'm live. Um, hi, I'm Alma Alexander, and I'll be reading from this book, my latest, this is the mirror effect, is it? Uh, my latest novel, The Second Star. And without further ado, uh, we'll start reading this. The grim-faced man at the head of the conference table wore a uniform unfamiliar to Stella Froud. Somehow that simple fact made him strangely threatening. As if to underline that impression, he swept an intense gaze around the table, catching and holding the eyes of each of the six people seated there for one long, powerful moment. This meeting is classified, he said. You have all already signed documents which say that you will not speak of anything you see or hear in this room to anyone who is not presently in it. The penalties for failing to do so are severe and they will be enforced. Is that absolutely clear to everybody? There were wordless nods. The uniformed man frowned. I need verbal agreement. Do you understand? He went round the table again. Everyone murmured their assent. They'd been interested before. Now some of them were alarmed. Stella, who had, trained, who had trained to observe the tiniest nuance of human reaction, could feel that wariness building behind the carefully schooled expressions of the five people sitting round the table with her. There were no grimaces or scowls, but their eyes had changed. Dr. Vivian Collins's pupils had dilated in shock. She was the only pure academic in the room and probably was not used to this kind of military atmosphere. I am General Aristide Niarchos, the man in uniform said. You are all here because our history has just collided with our future, and we hope that you, you in this room, will be able to find a path forward for us. Dr. Collins, would you please start us off with what is known about the Parada? Vivian Collins took a deep breath. Stella could see her hands clutching at the table in front of her in a white knuckled grip. There are lots of things I could tell you about that ship, she said. We have the specs right there. She flicked her wrist at the screen wall and it displayed a dense schematic of the guts of a starship, completely meaningless to most of the rest of the people in that room. A further wrist flick started the screen shifting into close-ups of individual parts of the schematic or scrolling tables full of incomprehensible numbers. Vivian glanced up at the screen with an almost distracted air and then back at the rest of the group and with a third flick of the wrist produced an image of a stocky ship floating against space in the orbital shipyard and froze the screen there. But that's the parada she said simply. We've all seen pictures, muttered John Lumumba, the engineer. I'd know that ship. Another woman at the table sitting on the far end, as far from the screen walls as possible in that room, sat forward, peering at the screen with a squint. Wait, she said, hesitating. That's not right. The gamma wing of the shipyard wasn't even built when the parada was made. Is that a composite? Vivian swallowed. No, you're right. It wasn't. Not when the original parada was in the shipyard. But that is the parada up there right now. The reaction ran down the table like a shiver. It's been almost a century since the last time anyone heard from that ship, Alicia Hernandez, the woman who had observed the incongruous gamma wing said, it's been nearly 200 years since it was launched. What do you mean that's the parada? The ship, the actual ship, the real ship? How, where did you find it? John Lumumba interjected. There was a small awkward pause and then the medic in the room, Dr. Ichiro Amari cleared his throat. The crew, he asked softly. He was most likely thinking about their physical well-being, the state they might have been in when they were found, or their extinction. 
but Stella Froud suddenly knew why she was there. It had, it had been something she had been puzzling over ever since she had got the summons and met the rest of the people in this room. All of them might have had something to do with the physical mastery of the mystery of the ghost ship that was the Parada, drifting home from the deep past, but only she, Stella Froud, pioneering psychometric counselor, dealt in the mind. The crew was alive. Somehow, impossibly, the crew was still alive and apparently insane enough to require stellar ministrations. Individual pieces of the Parada story were laid out in the boardroom as the day unraveled into evening. Stella understood very little of the math, which was presented in detail, and which at least two of the people in that room knew enough about to literally gasp at the implications were revealed to them by the numbers. But the number that stopped her in her tracks and sent her deep down the rabbit hole of its potential implications was staggering. She broke the rules and sat up and demanded that the general repeat the last thing he had just said. In the 200 years that the Parada has been out there, its crew has aged by less than three, General Nyarko said. Yes, you heard that right. Its drive was calibrated to run at 90% of light speed. For reasons unknown to us, it suddenly and somehow went much faster. It ran at closer to 99.99%. The tau factor increases by 10 in the speed it hit, and by the time dilation effects in increase exponentially. I don't understand that, Stella said impatiently. It's techno babble to me. Tell me in real terms. In real terms, at the specifications which the Parada was built for, in the time frame we we're talking about, the crew would have aged over just over 28 years for the two centuries that have passed for us back here, which in itself feels hard enough to believe. But because their drive impossibly kicked into a higher gear without their sanction or their knowledge, when we found them, the crew had aged by less than three years, 2.8 years exactly to be precise. So we have found the fountain of youth, asked John Lumumba with heavy headed levity. Stella favored with a quick scowl and then turned back to the general. I can see why they might think I could be of use here, she said. That kind of a Grand Canyon can be difficult to grasp or to adjust to. Some psychometric issues might well have arisen, but why do I get the feeling that there's more to this than just a handful of disoriented starfarers trying to come to terms with their lost two centuries? Because there is more to it than that, the general said. The Parada had a crew of six. If we are to believe the evidence we have before us, well, six people went out. More than 70 returned. Skipping forward just a bit. They had been household names, the crew of the Parada, when the ship had set out to the stars, specifically to explore exoplanets discovered during the early 21st century probes launched into the Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri systems. Six heroes had stepped on board humanity's first starship purely on faith. The world had waved them goodbye with tears of pride and had held its collective breath as the rendezvous rocket took what, had, what the media had branded the six to the stars up into the shipyard in Earth orbit where their craft waited for them, the Parada, new built, shining with promise, with dreams, with hope. Captain Hanford Milgar, First Officer Jerry Hillerman, Navigator Rob Hillerman, Engineer Bogdan Dimitrov, Ship's Medic Elia McGinty, Science Officer and Astronomer Lily Mae Washington. Their faces were on every screen in every home. Children were taken out of school to watch the launch of the rendezvous rocket, and then again when the cameras in orbit showed the Parada slowly easing out of dock, hanging there as though posing for a close-up against the backdrop of space glittering with stars and then turning away from the home planet, nose pointed into the dark. The people of Earth watched her begin moving away, getting smaller and smaller until she vanished from sight. For a little while, the media kept up with the ship, passing on such telemetry data as was received back. There were even occasional messages from the six of the stars sent while the ship still tiptoed her way through the solar system, passing Mars, sending images of Saturn that became as iconic as that first photograph of Earth hanging in the black skies of the moon had been back in the days of the moonshots, because those were literally the first images of a distant planet which had been taken by living human hands while living human eyes rested on it. But then the star drive kicked in, news from a ship became scarcer, and then other things took over the headlines as other things do. The next time the Parada returned to the news was when word came that all contact with the ship was completely lost. And then a hundred more years went by. The six of the stars were recognizable, vivid, remembered faces because they had been who they had been. They were written into history. Generations of children learned their names in classes. Millions had mourned them when they were presumed lost. But they were gone from living memory. No human on earth had, in the present day had been alive when the Parada had left the planet. 
seeing those historic faces and actual flesh and blood people under surveillance by way of CCTV cameras changed so little from the images remembered from historical documents of what for her had been two centuries ago in a room only a few corridors away from the one in which she was sitting had shaken Stella proud more than she knew. So um, basically she's sitting there uh, looking at all the, um, the, the data that she's got and she decides that she is not going to go um, chronologically or empirically. She just wants to learn, get to know these people. So she going to, she's going to um, look for things that she might not know she's going to find. She didn't know what she was looking for other than she would recognize it when she saw it. So she deliberately scrambled the chronology, accessing things at random rather than in order, assimilating the material she was presented with as she observed it. Some of this stuff she already knew. It was widely known in public knowledge. Some she knew, some she had once known and forgotten, and some of it was a revelation. Rob and Jerry Hillerman were a bottomless source of entertainment. They could range from the ridiculous to the profound, sometimes pivoting disconcertingly from one to the other in the space of a single interview, giving little warning. There was an entire subject of study right there for those so inclined. Stella pushed the button invoking the privacy zone, soundproofing her console from anyone else working in the area. She watched several video interviews with the pair, falling into the same fascination that they held for audiences of two centuries before. Are you happy that you're going out there together? A once very famous anchor of a morning chat show on TV asked brightly, flashing a smile too full of perfect teeth and wearing hair that looked like it had been, it had been sprayed on. The twins lounging on a red couch in poses that were so identical that a viewer's eyes watered at the prospect of simply seeing double, chose to answer this one seriously, at first anyway. Well, we thought about it, Rob said, quite a lot, actually. We knew that there had been at least two instances back in the days of early space station crews when they sent out one of a pair of twins and kept the other one back on Earth to compare with afterwards. A control experiment, Jerry said, as in would outer space change one human and leave his planet bound twin untouched? Or would there be no changes at all? Or would the magic of twins kick in and the planet bound twin would suddenly sprout the same pointed ears and cat pupil the alien eyes that the guy in space somehow got? Jerry was always the snarkier of the two. When they, when they did do the twin act, it was usually Jerry who began it, but he wasn't trying to derail the subject here. He just couldn't help being who he was. And you didn't want to be a lab rat, the anchor said sweetly. Rob actually smiled, tightly, but he managed to smile. Look, he said, when it came to those early instances, the space-faring twin really was just up there in orbit, might stay there for a month or a year or whatever, but still, Earth was just there, if necessary, there was the illusion that all he needed to do to get home would be just to strap on a parachute and jump. It wasn't like, you know, a permanent split, a terminal goodbye, Jerry said, and he wasn't for once smiling at all. We understood on a deep level that if we were chosen for this mission, it would be unlikely that we would see each other again in this lifetime. And if we by some miracle did, things would be very different. Time dilation is too complicated perhaps to get into here, Rob said. But if one of us went and the other stayed behind, the one who returned, if he returned, would return as still relatively young. If he found the other, the one who stayed behind, still alive to greet him, the one who waited would be an old, old man, having lived a stunted life. You don't understand, you can't, the bond between twins, unless you are one. We both knew that we wanted the stars, but with us, it was a double or nothing deal all the way. Both of us went or neither. We didn't want to think about the consequences of anything else but you wanted the stars, the anchor prodded. Rob looked up and there was something in his eyes that made Stella hold her breath even all these years later. Always, he said, and his voice had softened to the point that the mic he was wearing on the set almost struggled to catch the words. We would both stand out in our backyard and count them, what we could see of them. We lived too close to a big city and London life did their best to drown out the stars. We grew up with a washed out sky. But our uncle took us fishing in the summers, Jerry said, and out there in the country, the stars were different closer, more real. And then we'd go home, Rob said, and they'd disappear again. But once we had seen them, we could not forget they were there somewhere lost in the haze. And the less we saw them, the more we wanted them. So we decided to become spacemen in the way we could. We devoured education, Jerry said. We skipped at least a quarter of your average kids' school going years because we kept on jumping grades. We were doing college courses at the same time as we were sitting our O-levels. That's graduating high school, sort of, for you Yanks. By the time we'd finished our A-levels, we'd also accumulated nearly two years' worth of college credits. We made short work of the rest. We both graduated college before we were 20 and had advanced degrees by the time we were 25. And then you joined the World Space Agency. 
it was the European Space Agency still for about a year after we joined. And then the mergers happened and everyone finally pooled resources and knowledge. And that was the reason we could accomplish the Parada. Before that ship, yes, we joined the space agency and we did so with the full knowledge that we might well end up being one of those twin experiments that they seem to be so fond of. Like I said, we knew that coming in. It was an acceptable level of risk. Even with those st straight up miles of air and space that would separate us if they split us, we would still be essentially connected by the same world. But then they came to us about the starship. They approached us separately, Rob said, with the same tight smile he'd worn before. We'd been given no chance to talk to one another about it, but we gave them the same answer individually, even without the opportunity of discussing it. That far was too far. We both said we would stand ready to go out there if chosen for the mission, but only together or not at all. They agreed. So what is it that draws you out there in the end? Rob got that faraway look again, the one that made Stella's hackles rise. It's the stars, he said, and his voice had dropped again. It was as though he couldn't speak about this except in hushed tones, as though it was almost too big a miracle to utter out loud at all. I wanted to look at the stars up close, to look at the stars, to look the stars in the eye, he said. We are all star stuff, you know. You know that, don't you? The molecules inside you and me were forged in the heart of a star once. The stars are our brothers. I always knew they were there waiting for me. And then when, when this chance was offered to me, it wasn't the WSA that I heard calling me. It was their voices, the high sweet voices of those stars, where I was always meant to be. Yes, Jerry said, only that. It was remarkably easy to hold that depth in a corner of her attention when Stella watched a different show, a late night chat show, which was clearly more entertainment than informational, and the twins responded accordingly. So what do you plan on doing up there? The host asked, grinning broadly. The same thing we do down here, said Jerry. Finish each other's sentences, drive everyone mad, be the thing that keeps everyone sane up there, make everyone laugh. There's going to be a need for finding things to laugh about when things go wrong, as they inevitably will, as they always do. The host lifted both hands up in surrender, laughing. I almost wish I was going with you, he said, and sounded almost sincere about it. Probably not, Jerry said, and that's okay, Rob said. Not everyone is cut out for this stuff. This is the book. Um, I put the link up in um, the Discord chat for people who want to find out. Well, I'm going to put up a link over to my other linkies, um, my other books and what have you. Um, if anybody is uh, like me suffering from con withdrawal, one of my other books that you might want to pick up is called Abducticon, which is a con in a can book. Uh, it, it's, a, it's my love letter to fandom and to cons, and I think that probably going to enjoy reading it and taking it away with uh, with you as a sort of a con souvenir but I'll put all that up in the in the links I think I'm about out of time so I'm going to go trot up to discord if anybody wants to talk to me there and thank you all for listening